Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Adrian Dabrowski. My colleague Gabriel Dabrowski does his uh, work together with uh, Wilfred Meyer and Edgar Weipel. We will be talking about decoupling the SIM card from uh, the mobile phone or the modem to get all kinds of fancy measurements. Uh, and uh, it's called Cellular Carriers Hate District. I will explain it why. Using SIM tunnels to travel at light speed. So for the motivational example, let's assume we have like three medieval city-states and they recently invested uh, into technology and so they switched from landline to wireless, to cellular net networks. And uh, we have like all this uh, new mobile phone operators popping up like Knight Mobile or Arthur and Excalibur with the sword in there and Dragon Phone and all the others. And with that, we also had like an explosion of uh, new social networks. Uh, and uh, we'll have something like Royal Tweet and Bartboard and Peasant Post. And uh, all these people are like super hooked on uh, social networks. So the mobile phone operators think, well, how do we target the, some demographics that are that like social networks? So they come up with this new data plans where there is something already included like video streaming or messaging or social network apps. And uh, we have like, it's super transformative. It's very addictive. You have all these people spending hours and hours on end on the social networks. And um, I heard that the king over there is, got actually so much hooked on it. He's uh, considering buying royal tweet and renaming it to the Roman numeral of 10. <laughs> and so uh, this is Archibald. Um, he recently switched from alchemy to uh, cellular network research. And uh, he also likes, has a few friends abroad, and he also already found a few inconsistencies and, and maybe vulnerabilities in his local network. But he is a bit a prisoner of his own city-state. Well, when, he is, when he can travel, he can like do the measurements abroad in another network, but uh, also when he's visiting his friends, he actually would like to spend time with the friends. And also it's getting very expensive. Um, so why is roaming so complex or why is it so interesting? Uh, the, the interesting thing with roaming is that you have your home network operator on one side and uh, the, your visiting mobile network operator that using some interconnection in between uh, pretend to you as the customer that they're providing a singular set of services and a consistent set of services. Although they're using completely different configurations, hardware, software, uh, manufacturers, whatnot. And so uh, at a closer look, uh, we see that this picture of a consistent service pretty fast falls apart. And you might wonder, well, when I'm abroad, how is my traffic actually routed? And there are two ways. You can have either local breakout or you can have home, route, home routing. Interestingly, depending on the service that you're using, it will either use one or the other. So for example, if you're uh, using data, that's usually home routed. So even if you're abroad, all your data will exit with an IP address of your home network operator. So you can't use all the fancy geo-locked services uh, uh, in another country, unless you connect to the Wi-Fi. Uh, for other services, like voice, you have local breakout. Uh, back in the 1980s, when GSM was specified, um, or even today, voice is considered as a time-critical service, so you like to get it out into the public networks as fast as possible with a route as short as possible. So technically, for example, voice roaming works uh, uh, by, the by the visiting network operator issuing you a temporary phone number in that country that you're visiting, and your 
home network operator then reroutes all the incoming calls to this new temporary phone number. Uh, so you have like all the small differences in roaming. And so while Archibald likes to travel, it's getting very expensive, and all this testing can be quite tedious. Let's look at an example. So whoever uh, um, travels in internationally for DEF CON might have received that SMS. That's because AT&T doesn't support voice roaming for uh, most European carriers. However, it does support data and and uh, SMS. So you might even get billed for voice traffic while in the US without being able to use voice. And so you have all the small oddities and let's see, can we measure that in our toy example? So let's take one SIM card. We have like one home operator plus uh, three network operators in uh, one uh, uh, other city-state and in the other. However, that's just one SIM card. Of course, there are multiple carriers within our home network or home country, so we'll have to buy multiple SIM cards. And, uh, but there are also uh, more than one data plan, which might be uh, important because uh, they support different services. So we'll have to multiply by that. But then, of course, you have all the network operators for in the other city states as well. And we end up, like just in our toy example, with one, 190 combinations. So clearly, that doesn't scale well. And uh, what are the possibilities here for Archibald to uh, continue his work? Well, he could buy a lot of SIM cards and a lot of modems and position them uh, everywhere, uh, well, in the three countries, but, um, well, the hardware costs, the monthly costs, and soon after that, a bankruptcy, so that doesn't work. Uh, well, you could have, like, one modem in each country and then ship SIM cards around, but that has, like, large uh, overhead and the shipping times and a lot of manual labor. Or what we did is try to decouple the SIM card from the modem. So usually the SIM card and the modem are like one unit, and they communicate with each other, but what if we can extend this internal bus uh, all around the globe? And so that's what Mobile Atlas does. Uh, the, the academic name is Geographically Decoupling Cellular Measurements and Exploitation. And with that, we can now like solid state travel. We can uh, connect SIM cards to different places all around, to our modems all around the world and uh, pretend to the network operators that we are in that country and do our measurements there and tests. So what were our goals with the project? Well, of course, scalability, automatability, but also a po important point is control the background noise. If you use like a off-the-shelf cellular phone, then you have a, like a full-blown operating system on it with all kinds of background tasks, and that will in might interfere with the measurements you are doing or with the exploits you are testing, depending on what uh, what you are precisely doing. And we also would like to have like the full feature spectrum. So. Um, for those who know RIPE Atlas, uh, so our name Mobile Atlas basically is a homage to RIPE Atlas. RIPE Atlas is a probe system um, developed and maintained by the European Internet uh, authorities or um, administration. And uh, they have like the probes and you can do uh, pings and trace routes between different autonomous systems. However, in a cellular world, we have more than just an internet or data connection. We also have like phone calls, we have USSDs, we have text messaging. So we would like to ideally to test or have a test system that works on all these uh, features. So here, short diagram, traditional uh, combinatorial explosion. You put in probes in different countries and replicate all the SIM cards or you have something where you can tunnel the SIM cards to one place and uh, save a lot of on, on costs. 
So basically, that's what we did. Uh, we decoupled the SIM card. We, we, we can have a SIM card reader uh, connected to a computer, and we have then a TCP tunnel to our measurement probes and uh, replicate the SIM card there. And so, like, add a management uh, on top of it, and you end up with a system like on the left side you have the probes, on the right you have the SIM cards, and you have a SIM provider, which is basically just a piece of software that connects to a PCSC or serial or, or even an Android phone and uh, routes the SIM card traffic to the probes. Um, it needs to be an online connection because the SIM cards produce all the cryptographic material that we need on the network side to authenticate and to encrypt the traffic there. So this has been a project for uh, ongoing for uh, five years now. So we have, like, you can see our left probe, uh, which looks very crude. So we put in, we had like a Raspberry Pi and a USB adapter and then a, a M M2 modem attached to this adapter, and because everything was very loose in the box, we put in like this yellow piece of foam in there to like hold everything in place. Uh, but the current version uh, looks much more professional. Uh, it's uh, a shield on top of the Raspberry Pi. And so then you also, the only other thing you need is an Ethernet connection for the uplink. And so on one side, we have the SIM provider, which is basically just this piece of software that works with uh, all the usual SIM provider, uh, uh, SIM card readers. You can use the more expensive PCSC readers or the very cheap Chinese SIM readers that only speak a very crude serial protocol, or you can even use uh, uh, Android phone. Um, oh, we didn't have the picture. Okay, or maybe it's, la uh, maybe it's later in, in our slides. So um, I briefly want to talk about um, the challenges uh, that we faced and like, have to pick like two because of time. So um, let's talk about the SIM interface and the SIM protocol. So the SIM card protocol is basically a smart card protocol, but it's uh, now 40 years old, uh, so you have a lot of different options, voltages, speeds, uh, and, uh, and all uh, kinds of that. And also it was designed to be, uh, to work within one device, so with very low latencies. When we stretch that over half of the globe, we need to, a few techniques to um, uh, uh, cope with the latency. Um, so you can see, for example, this is how we connected it to the, GP, uh, the SIM uh, slot of the modem to the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. We just made a very small, simple adapter that we slot in. Our first version was actually directly soldered in. Um, and you can see just one component on it, and that's a shotkey diode. Why is that? Because the SIM card uh, I.O. pin is actually an open collector bus. So on the Raspberry Pi side, we need a shotkey diode to split up the uh, send and receive channels for the UART. And uh, the pull-up resistor is already provided by the modem. Um, luckily for us, uh, this reduces a lot of complexity for us. Uh, we can negotiate speeds and voltages and other parameters um, independently on the SIM provider side and on the modem side. Uh, we don't have to pass it one, uh, one on one. Uh, so that eases uh, much uh, of, of the problems. We can also add waiting time extensions and we tested it for latencies up to uh, 1,000 milliseconds, so this should be actually be good enough even for like Starlink connections. And future work, we'd like to also locally emulate uh, some of the files that are not necessary uh, um, for, the, for the modem or for the measurements to work. The second problem that I'd like to mention is uh, traffic metering, and we need a way to control the background traffic. Uh, so no, let's uh, uh, step back. So some of the tests we want to do is test the accounting, the data accounting of network operators. So we need very precise measurements on 
uh, what we are sending to the network and what is then accounted. And so the background traffic um, is something that will mess up with these measurements. And the other thing is that uh, the call data records often are shown in the, uh, on the operator website uh, with a large delay. So domestically, this can be like hours, but internationally, this can be something ar around days. And uh, also, uh, there is no like standardized way to check your account balance. Uh, so some operators use an app or a web application. Some can use or support USSD codes or SMS inquiries. Um, so to eliminate background traffic, we basically uh, use Linux network spaces. That's the same thing that Docker does. Uh, so uh, our measurement process is um, put into a, a separate namespace that's then connected to the modem and only that one talks to the modem. So all the traffic from the, that process groups is routed through the modem and all the other things like the management uh, uh, suite is all uh, um, over the VPN. They're completely separated. How do we de deal with delayed traffic accounting? Well, we came up with a binary encoding. So what we do is like, for example, the first test uh, is what, like one megabyte in size. The second test is two megabyte. The third one is four and the, uh, and the fourth test is eight and so on. So uh, one of these also will be a control group so that at the end, like maybe a day later when it finally shows up on the accounting balance, we can then distinguish exactly which test was accounted and which wasn't, like which traffic group. You might ask, well, you do all this thing to like tunnel physical SIM cards across the globe, what's about eSIMs? Um, the problem with eSIMs, even though, for example, in the US they're pretty prevalent, uh, they are not widely available uh, everywhere. And also, it usually tends to only cover some, par uh, some data plans and not all. And they're not always easy transferable between devices. So what we actually can do is we can use a Bluetooth RSUP protocol to connect to a uh, Android phone that then shares the SIM card uh, over Bluetooth to our system. The uh, SIM access profile was, a re was actually delivered I think, uh, or uh, developed somewhere in the 90s to allow cars to connect to your phone and then use the SIM card on, on your phone and the modem from the car. But today this is rarely actually used. So the only thing you need to do on an Android is make the eSIM your primary SIM card and then uh, you get the screen and you um, uh, allow the usage. In the title we said carriers hate this trick. That might be a little bit controversial. Why do we think carriers hate this trick? Well, SIM tunneling isn't exactly new. Uh, it has al already been used for over-the-top bypass fraud. So that's when you use uh, batteries of SIMs uh, or SIM banks uh, to terminate international travel uh, or international calls within a country because usually local call rates are cheaper than international interconnect fees. However, we do actually the, com the opposite. We are tunneling from domestic to abroad to test the, all the other uh, networks. So this might also hint why this might be an opportunity for uh, carriers um, to have such a system. Um, because nowadays carriers have to rely on their roaming partners to deliver the services the way that they want it to uh, uh, for their customers. Uh, but with, um, uh, with a system like this, the carriers can actually verify the, the services and especially things like voice over LT roaming, which lacks a good auto configuration protocol and it causes a lot of troubles in, uh, internationally. Uh, this might actually help to test the different configurations. So what have we learned uh, during the implementation of our system? There are a few 
uh, well, surpri some surprising results. First, if you like read like almost any book on cellular networks, they will basically say something al among the lines that the IMSI the, uh, is basically the unique identifier of a SIM card. Uh, and that's they're also used to like find your home operator and stuff like that. However, even in our small test set, we found several examples of SIM cards that can actually update the SIM, uh, the IMSI over the air or change it uh, dynamically. This is usually used for, in, uh, for, uh, for selecting a roaming network. So it's not like you're not selecting the, uh, the, uh, the network that you're uh, using as a visitor. You're selecting someone that will then uh, that has all the, the contracts in place with all the operators in the different country so that they have just one, like, one place to, to do their accounting and to work with. And the other thing that we've learned is um, that th theoretically there is a 127 device limit on USB, but practically it's hard to get over 20 or 30. Uh, that has to do with lousy hardware, weak drivers, the power consumption, even if you use active hubs. And we've tried several things. Oh, here are the pictures. So like on the left, you can see like the bo uh, we bought like a box of 100 SIM card readers in, on AliExpress. And then we tried to run them like naively on, on all the uh, single uh, USB hubs uh, that turned out to be yeah, very error prone. Um, and then we also tried this professional USB hubs that are used by or have been used by miners for like this USB FPGA boards, uh, but this also didn't work well. Where do we stand today? So now our system is deployed to uh, 10 European countries and to North American. You can see Canada isn't fully covered. That has to do with uh, that in Canada, not all the bare metal operators uh, are available in all the provinces. Our current uh, probe in Canada is in the Yukon Territory, uh, so that's why it's just half green. Ethical considerations. So there are some ethical considerations we have to talk about. You might, for example, ask why, don't, why do we use modems and don't use uh, software defined radios? I mean, one, on the one side, software-defined radios give you much more capabilities on the radio side. On the other side, all the open source implementations usually only focus on one access technology, so you can get like a GSM implementation or you can get an LTE implementation, but you cannot get like one implementation that covers all the access technologies. And the other thing is that it's um, a regulatory minefield. So we give out or we, so far, we gave out these probes to friends and family uh, in different countries. And we cannot like, subject them to the risk of having a software-defined radio and all the radio, re radio regulatory problems that might come with that. So we rather opt for unmodified, globally certified um, modems that are safe uh, to use in, in all the countries. The second thing that I want to mention is we do not enrich ourselves with our, with our tests, for example, with the traffic accounting tests. So we made sure that at the end of the month we let expire at least that amount of traffic uh, that wasn't accounted in our uh, tests. And with that, I switch over to Gabriel, who will talk about um, the results and what you can actually do with our system. Yeah, thank you. So I would say let the games begin. So let's take a look at uh, what we can do with this fancy platform. Um, I'll walk you through a few showcases. Uh, of course, our platform has uh, very uh, versatile capabilities, uh, but the first one will be an internet uh, 
uh, related measurement case. So it will be about serrating measurements, it will be billing uh, measurements. And also uh, after presenting the measurements, we will show some, some proof of concept, how you could abuse this uh, serrating offers, or how an attacker could abuse this to, to gain some free internet traffic. So what is serrating? Actually, there are some uh, providers that offers, the, that, that offers this uh, kind of um, programs and offers. Um, usually, they provide several groups for applications. So in this screenshot example, there is a group for messaging application, uh, for social media applications, and also for video. Uh, so for example, for Netflix. And uh, yeah, they offer this. The customers can, can buy a package, and then uh, they can gain um, or by buying this package, they gain unmetered access to, to this kind of applications. Um, of course, from a carrier perspective, uh, this um, data traffic, all the data traffic that passes the provider needs to be um, classified. So they need to be, um, it needs to be separated uh, and needs uh, to be classified into build traffic and also serrating traffic. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at which uh, possibilities there are for, for the cellular uh, carrier. So uh, which metrics could be used for the classification. Uh, a very old metric that um, has been used back in the days to classify and to then block uh, BitTorrent traffic was the TCP or UDP port. Uh, nowadays it's mainly used in conjunction with some other metrics. Um, because it's kind of vague. Uh, most of the traffic anyway is web traffic, so it might be using port 4 for free. Um, and yeah, you could easily uh, like fake this port, uh, thereby it's not that reliable. Uh, however, the IP address is kind of accurate, uh, especially for all those uh, big services like WhatsApp. Uh, usually the IP address uh, of the services is pretty static, so it's a reliable classification metric. Uh, some provider might use some, some cloud hosting so some applications, uh, but yeah, usually if it's a big uh, application, it's, it's pretty stable. So it's a good classification metric. Um, also, some operators use the packet inspection. So this is uh, when the classification mechanism doesn't uh, only look at the packet header, but also at the content of the packets. So the, uh, the classifier needs to be protocol aware. It needs to understand what the fields of the protocol mean. Uh, and yeah, this is um, also commonly used. Um, also for our measurements, we focused on IP address uh, and on the packet inspection uh, classification. Uh, for the packet inspection, we mainly focused on host name based uh, classification. Uh, but also there are some other metrics. So some operators, for example, classify by the time to live to, to um, detect or to block uh, mobile hotspots. And uh, since yeah, this is kind of popular with any problem, uh, there are also some people throwing machine learning at it. Yeah, let's take a look for the packet inspection. So this is uh, a tip packet inspection, so this is an example for hostname based classification. Uh, if the traffic is just HTTP free, it's pretty straightforward because we do not have any encryption. So the classifier can simply take a look at the host header of, of the protocol. Uh, if it's an encrypted connection uh, like HTTPS or HTTP free, um, the classifier actually has to take a look at the uh, TLS handshake and uh, thereby uh, take a look at the uh, client hello message that contains the server name indication. Uh, but yeah, it's again pretty similar. So just the host name is extracted and thereby the uh, traffic is classified. Um, yeah, within our study, we've bought some SIM cards. We've measured seven operators of three different countries. And within those SIM cards, we've analyzed the uh, available um, applications, zero rating applications. And we figured that WhatsApp, Snapchat, and Facebook and Facebook Messenger were the most popular applications. Um, they are, uh, like any um, Android or iOS application, they are heavily uh, communicating via uh, web APIs, via web endpoints. Uh, we got some traffic dumps from, from those um, applications and also reverse engineered the, the applications. And uh, yeah, we found some, some endpoints that we could use uh, for our measurements to, to, to probe this uh, kind of uh, web servers. And uh, for the selected web endpoints, um, 
we found that they support HTTP, HTTPS, and HTTP3, and also they are uh, hosted via dual stack, so you could uh, uh, communicate to them via IPv4 or, or IPv6. Um, yeah, we've had two measurement campaigns, and yeah, we've measured, we've, we've executed measurements um, in the domestic case, but also during roaming conditions. Our basic me methodology for this kind of serrating measurements was to get the credit, then to execute some experiments, and then uh, wait for the data to be built, and again, um, yeah, get the credit and calculate the, the delta. Um, and within the experiment, we had some payload that was potentially serrated, and afterwards, as Adrian already explained, we also had some uh, control traffic uh, that was acting as a, as a marker, so we knew when all the, the data uh, units were built. And um, for the serrating experiments, we had three experiments. The first one was to verify that actual that the, the web endpoints that we selected are actually serrating, serrated, and uh, the other two were to uh, kind of learn more about the classification, so the, to, to detect IP-based or hostname-based classification methods. So this is um, a chart for the very first experiment. We have our mo mo mobile atlas measurement probe on the left side, and we have some uh, web endpoints on the right side. So in this case, uh, we are probing WhatsApp. So we are just repeatedly uh, querying or retrieving uh, some, um, some uh, web endpoints uh, until our specified data um, units uh, were retrieved. Uh, and afterwards, we do the same with some control traffic that usually is, is bigger. Uh, and when the control traffic uh, is built, we know um, that the experiment is finished and we can say whether the first traffic was subtracted from our data quota or whether not. Uh, to detect IP-based classification, the test case was pretty similar, so uh, the actors didn't change, but uh, we uh, just spoofed the host header, so the data packets were still going to the WhatsApp um, web server, but the host header didn't match the WhatsApp endpoint anymore, and so if for this case the packets still were serrated, uh, we knew that uh, most probably some IP-based classification is in place, uh, and we did a similar thing to detect host name based classification, uh, but we needed to introduce another actor. So in this ca test case, we automatically spin up an AWS instance that just forwards all the necessary ports to the WhatsApp application, uh, so to the, to the WhatsApp uh, web server. And thereby, uh, the host header didn't change because the uh, content of the data packets was exactly the same. Uh, but the IP address changed. So when the traffic classifier is uh, watching the data packets, is inspecting the data, data packets, uh, the host header is still WhatsApp, but the IP address is um, uh, the IP address of our AWS instance. And thereby, if the traffic is still serrated in this case, we knew uh, again that uh, some host name based classification is used. So let's come to some results. Um, yeah, as you can see, we found that um, operators are using both IP-based and hostname-based classification. Uh, sometimes they even combine it, so in these cases uh, they um, serrated the traffic when uh, either one of the rules applied. And interestingly, for two operators, actually we uh, were not able to verify zero rating. So all the, the tested um, packets were fully built, although uh, this operator um, promoted and, and sold some zero rating packages to their customers. Um, we were very surprised by this. And um, to make sure that this isn't just a, a quirk of our measurement um, methodology, we also uh, simulated uh, this on our smartphone. So uh, we, we just verified it. We downloaded uh, the Facebook application. Uh, we plugged our SIM cards, the corresponding SIM cards. And we, again, uh, did some measurements. And we could verify that a huge portion, so over 90% of the actual application traffic uh, was wrongfully built. Um, yeah, additionally, some operators turned off zero rating during roaming. So this already was uh, challenged by the national regulators in some countries. And um, yeah, nevertheless, uh, we found some operators still doing this. Um, 
Additionally, we found one operator that was uh, billing traffic when the endpoint uh, was um, was retrieved via IPv6. So when IPv6 was used, um, the the packets again were wrongfully built. Similarly, for HTTP3, so when we were uh, accessing the uh, relevant endpoints, relevant application by HTTP3. Uh, again, the traffic was fully built. And interestingly, for one operator, uh, as I showed earlier, we had uh, two measurement campaigns. For one operator, actually, the packets got built in the first period, but then uh, it got fixed, and in the second period, it was fine. Um, yeah. So. Archie is a security researcher, so he's, he is not only interested in how those things work, but also how he or how an attacker could uh, exploit these kind of things. Um, yeah, we have uh, two cases. So the first one is if hostname based classification was used. Uh, in this case, um, for HTTP, it's pretty straightforward. You just would need to write some relaying script that fakes the host header. Uh, sometimes the provider during the classification even just uses a simple regex for the host string. Uh, if HTTPS was used, it's maybe a little more complex, but still this is just uh, content of the packet. So you can, uh, you can spoof that, you can change that, and you could maybe, uh, like, implement something on the top of OpenVPN and spoof the SNI to, to kind of um, pretend to be um, WhatsApp traffic, for example. So this is similar to, to domain fronting, this technique, if it's for TLS connections. Um, for IP-based classification, this, however, is a little more complex. Um, so you would need uh, to have a server where you could spoof IP addresses. Uh, also, it would only work for the downlink because if the client sends some uh, packets to some Spotify IP, obviously, or some, some WhatsApp IP, obviously the uh, packets will just uh, yeah, land at Spotify or at WhatsApp. Uh, but for the downlink, uh, this is a feasible thing to do. So uh, you could simply uh, replace the, the source IP address at, at your relay point, at your um, VPN maybe, uh, and then pretend to be Spotify. And then the packets will be classified as serrated packets and, and you can get some, some um, free internet or an attacker could do that. Um, yeah, for TCP it might be a little more complex because we have this connection-based approach and we have the freeway handshake. But for UDP, uh, this is totally feasible. So, and, and this is what we did. Uh, we had a SIM card with uh, Spotify, with free Spotify. Um, we set up a VPN uh, with WireGuard on the server where we could spoof the packets and, uh, yeah. Then we wrote a kernel module, a kernel extension that rewrites the, the IP address of the outgoing packets. And uh, yeah, for the provider, these kind of packets look like Spotify. And uh, we already came up with a nice name for, for this proof of concept. And I hope you like it as well. So we called it Spoofify. OK. Now let's continue with some other showcases. So the second one is some privacy-related showcase. It's uh, location tracking with ringback tones. So what is the ringback tone? The ringback tone is the tone that you hear when you call somebody and when you basically wait for them to, to pick up. So it's this uh, audio feedback that you get. Uh, the interesting thing is that this is issued by the terminating operator. So in case of roaming, this is issued by the roaming partner. And the interesting thing as well is that we have different ringback tones for different regions. So for example, in the US, operators use this uh, dual ringing of 440 and 480 hertz. And in Europe, most operators use something around uh, 425 hertz. So for these two cases, you could even uh, hear the difference with your bare ear. Uh, but also we found that within Europe, uh, when operators use very similar settings, it's totally feasible to uh, record this tone and to uh, differentiate between operators. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples. Uh, this is from Vodafone in Romania. We have a peak frequency of 430 hertz. This is the spectrum. Uh, and also at the left, we see the amplitude. If we compare to a German provider, we see that another different, uh, a different uh, frequency is used, and also the, the amplitude differs, so it's louder for the German provider. Uh, and if we compare to another German provider, we see that the frequency stays the same, but the amplitude change and also uh, like 
the, the signal is less clear, there are some side lobes, some, yeah. And we did this for all the available operators and then we printed a scatter plot with the uh, amplitude and with the frequency. And as you see, uh, this is kind of nice scattered, nice divided across the, the diagram, the figure. So um, yeah, you can easily take those two metrics and, and um, determine the, the operator that uh, terminated the call. And uh, yeah, you can use this uh, to um, kind of um, find out the country of, of the person that uh, you co just called. So you just need one test call uh, and then you know that the, the country where the person is in. Um, also, you could, of course, use some, some other metrics like the overtones I just showed you uh, or some, some uh, duty cycle. We also had differences in this. Uh, or you could also use some other call progress tones to, to fingerprint. And this is also interesting uh, from a attacker perspective for SIM swapping uh, because you could also use this to um, uh, find out the responsible home operator and then you know, uh, yeah whom you need to call to swap the SIM card, maybe. Uh, yeah, now let's come to the last showcase. So this is um, some um, proactive SIM communication showcase. Um, since we tunnel all this uh, SIM communication, we have uh, full access to the, um, to the communication, to the uh, payload that is sent uh, between the modem and the SIM card. And SIM cards are kind of mighty uh, and powerful microcontrollers, so they can even run some Java. They can, there is this instruction set of proactive SIM commands where the SIM basically can take over control and can tell the smartphone what to do. So it, the SIM could tell the smartphone to send an SMS message to display some, some text uh, on, the, on the handset. Uh, and yeah, since we have all this um, communication of our measurements, we can analyze it. And for our measured SIM cards, we found two SIM cards that were phoning home, so that were covertly sending some uh, binary SMS messages. And uh, this is pretty scary, actually, because it happens totally in the, in the background. The, the user, the smartphone user, doesn't know of it. Uh, interestingly, also, we had some cases where this kind of binary SMS uh, were also built by the operator. So uh, during roaming, these SMSs were even built. Um, uh, that's pretty shit from a user perspective. <laughs> um, yeah, we tried to analyze the content of this binary SMS, and we found out that there is uh, some um, information about the uh, user equipment. So for example, the uh, EMI, but also uh, from the SIM card. So ECCC ID and MC uh, were in there. Yeah, if you're interested in um, getting some more insights, we've published two papers. So the first one is about zero rating measurements. It's called zero rating one big mess. And the second one is basically the white paper of our platform. It was just presented at the USENIX conference some days ago. So for conclusion, um, Archibald can now, like when he's traveling, uh, uh, spend more time with his friends. Uh, because uh, with, for all the measurements, like longitudinal measurements or uh, exploit testing and development, he can now use a platform to do this from the comfort of uh, his home. Um, we find roaming especially interesting because it's this special case where two operators with completely different setup have to cooperate and pretend to be one. And we showed you a few use cases you find more in, in our paper from two days ago from USENIX security uh, about like how to hide and dress up traffic uh, uh, as one of the free services so you don't have to pay for it, uh, how you can locate other uh, subscribers based on the ringback tone and uh, some internals uh, such as proactive SIM communication. Um, We'd like to thank all these institutions like an LNET, University of Vienna, Technical University of Vienna, SBA Research, CISPA, and the SSL Laboratory from UCI uh, for supporting us over these five years. You'll find uh, the URL and our contact information up here. The whole project is open sourced. Um, if you are from a country that you think that is interesting to us, to host a probe, uh, please get in contact with us. 
Uh, we have actually uh, brought some uh, probes uh, here to DEFCON. And yes, thank you a lot.